Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, come on by and join us at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Today we are going to finish up this little book, one of the pastoral epistles in Titus. And we'll be in chapter 3. Let's go ahead and pray. Gracious Father, may you lead us and guide us in your word, and may it minister to us, Father, encourage us and strengthen us in this day and age, Father, where we are challenged, Father, in our faith, whether we will be hot or cold or lukewarm, Lord. We're challenged, Father, to the application of your precious word in our lives as we walk daily with you, Lord. May your Holy Spirit minister to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, all right, so let's look at chapter three as we continue on. Now, I want to just say something before we get in here because Paul's going to be encouraging them to maintain good works. Now, I taught a message on Sunday, and this message was from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, and, and really the whole message of it was <clears throat> to run the race that God has put us in. Now, I think, and it's probably my fault, I think I wasn't clear enough <clears throat> with that message because I had some comments afterwards that, you know, aren't we already in the race? Um, I had uh, asked after the whole message was over if anybody was not in the race and would like to be in the race to stand up. And I don't know if anyone stood up outside, but no one stood up inside. And so uh, after a few comments, I realized that... Um, there might, be some, there might have been some misunderstanding as to uh, what race they're entering in. Uh, you can enter the wrong race, by the way. You know, when I was in high school, there were so many meets going on <clears throat> that you could actually be in the wrong meet. So you had to make sure that you're in the right meet at the right time, at the right age group, whether it was seniors, varsity, JV, or freshmen. And so you had to be in the right meet. And, and there was this misunderstanding, and so I want to kind of clarify it before we get into this. Uh, not that the church is here, uh, that they would hear it, but there's a race. Now, obviously, we have to ask the question, what is ministry? What is ministry? I mean, do we separate our family life from ministry life? And Pastor Chuck said, no, you don't. Everything is ministry. And if you look at the life of King David, everything was ministry to him, including his family, his children, his kingdom. It's all ministry. So if everything is ministry, then... Uh, we have to realize and choose to be in what kind of ministry? Uh, because there are two kinds of ministries in this world. There is the worldly ministry, and then there is the godly ministry. You're either in the kingdom of the world, or you're in the kingdom of God, uh, working and serving God, or you're working and serving yourself in, in the kingdom of this world. And, and that was something that I don't think I made clear, that if you are... In the kingdom of this world, what does that look like? Well, it, it means that uh, you know you're a married couple with children, and of course, obviously, you work to maintain your household, pay your bills, uh, provide for your children, uh, have a retirement. If so, uh, that's what the world does. That's what everyone is hoping to do. Not everyone does. The majority of the world is very impoverished and poor, and doesn't even get. I get to invest in those kind of future things. But that's what the world does. And if we were to lump everybody into that one kingdom of the culture, everyone does that, including Christians, non-Christians, uh, believers and non-believers. They're all doing that, providing for the world. Now, here's the difference. Christians now move that over to working and running in the kingdom of God. Now they are purposely choosing to run a race for the kingdom of God not just for themselves. Because in this kingdom of the world, they're basically running a race for themselves. What I can get, how I can accumulate it, how can I provide for my kids, vacation, timeshares, all of these wonderful things. In the kingdom of God, you have those wonderful things, but the priority is the kingdom of God. And that's what Paul was saying, that the priority was preaching the gospel message and somehow creating a <clears throat> church system which god has we call it the church which is a building that houses god's people uh, he's created that system now to uh, further the gospel by reaching the community and so you move everything from that cultural place and you bring it into the kingdom of god and you enter into that race 
That is the race that I was talking about. That's the race that Paul is talking about here. It's totally separate. And we think that we think that just because I am providing for my family and their future and so forth is working for the kingdom of God. And it isn't, not completely anyway. It is a part of it, but it's not a complete part of it. And so I hope that makes sense to you, that we should be in the kingdom of God. That means that we should be in church. We should be involved with church things. We should be involved with with religious things as far as, uh, you know, helping the orphans and those that are widows and so forth. <clears throat> those are the types of things that we're helping in the kingdom of God uh, to help with the gospel message. So saying that, Paul starts chapter 3 saying, remind them, Titus, because he's speaking to Titus as a young pastor here, and he's saying, remind them to be subject to rulers. Now that word to be is in the continual tense and it's emphasized in the Greek. So this is how we read. Remind them to be continually subject to rulers and authorities to obey and to be continually ready for every good work. Again, what good work? He's talking about good works here. Now, yes, the Bible talks about good works. The Bible talks about being involved in the kingdom. I cannot apologize for that. I don't know how many people have come up to me and said, why do we have to be involved in the kingdom of God? Can't we just come to church and, and that's it and live our lives? No, the Bible teaches that we're to be servants in the kingdom of God. And that's a concept they don't understand because all we do think about is our own family and circle and we're in this bubble and that should be enough. <coughs> Where God says, get out of that bubble <coughs> because there's a bigger uh, outreach going on in the world today. And so <coughs> the fact that Paul here is telling Titus to remind them to continually be subject to rulers, that is to those within the church, the pastors and the elders and, and those deacons and those ministry leaders to be subject to them uh, and to be uh, ready continually for every good work. Now, <clears throat> uh, to Wednesday night, we're going to be looking at Korah. It's a rebellion. It's a long chapter, 50 verses. Mm. So we're going to go through it rather quickly, but I'm going to make some points and one of the points that I'm probably going to make is that Korah was, was not happy. He was not content with the position that God gave him. And so he looked for another position, and that position was Moses' position. And so he came against Moses, and he divided Moses' camp and rebelled against Moses. And Moses fell on his face and prayed and sought the Lord to not allow this to happen. And God ended up swallowing Dathan and Athan uh, and Korah's completely through uh, the earth. Now, why do I say that? Because they weren't maintaining good works. They were actually looking how to build their own little kingdom, how to advance themselves because they were not satisfied with the position that God gave them. See, positions come from God and not from man. And so we have to be satisfied right where we are at in the place that we're at. Doesn't mean that we can't advance and go forward because that's how they chose uh, deacons in the early church. Find faithful men who are already doing the work of the ministry and you recognize what God is doing in them and then you raise them up as church leaders. That's the church and that's how the church functions. And so uh, we need to be maintaining good works and being obedient. Then he goes on and says, to speak evil of no one <clears throat> and be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility, to all men, for we ourselves were also once foolish or unwise or without understanding, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Um, wow, there's so much here. Uh, he said you were once foolish in the sense that you weren't peaceable, you weren't gentle, you weren't showing humility. You actually had all these carnal characteristics like disobedience to all authority. Um, we, we had some theft here in the church yesterday. Uh, we give out probably, I don't know how many tons uh, worth of food, but it's a lot every Sunday to over 100 families to our community. And we have had some theft in the past where, where some have come in and they'll go through the restrooms and they'll scavenge through and find whatever they can take 
with them and then they'll, they'll leave. And just some little items, but this last week we had quite a few items taken. Uh, items that were, uh, I'm sure, for their necessities like toilet paper, there was some Lysol cleaners, um, scent uh, bottles that we used for the restrooms and so forth. But they came in and they pretty much ransacked both men and women's restrooms. And we kind of know <clears throat> who probably did it because we know the people now. And when there's a newcomer, we kind of <clears throat> keep our eye on them. And they came in. And so we have an example there of someone that's coming in to receive food freely that we give to them. And we're doing them a service, but then they go a little further and they're disobedient to the law of theft. You know, that you don't steal that's what the Bible says. One of the commandments is, thou shall not steal. But they feel that uh, our graciousness and liberties of giving them food uh, isn't enough. And so they'll go beyond and they take even more uh, than um, what they probably should have. Now, if they would have asked, we probably would have given to them whatever they needed. Uh, and then they were scoping out the, the property later on in the afternoon. And so, you know what? This church, we grew up on this. I grew up on the streets. Randy grew up on the streets. We know what's happening. We know what's going on. We know how it works, you know? So it's not like our eyes are blinded, but we do choose to not prosecute, not go after because of God's grace and what he's done in our own life. And so that's disobedience. That's the world. That's foolishness. Uh, that's deceptiveness. It's, it's to stray and to wander. And that's what these people do. They stray and they wander in this world, just trying to rip off others so that they could survive. Serving various lusts, um, pleasures, uh, those things that they enjoy themselves, because that's all it is about, is themselves. They're selfish people. Living in malice, that is in, in wickedness. And envying, that is jealousy. And hateful. And hating one another. Hating one another. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm blown away by the church sometimes at, at, at how much gossip and, and evil speaking goes on within the church. Even in our little church, you know, once in a while I'll hear someone say, do you know what so-and-so said? Do you know what so-and-so did? You know, and I'm like, really? Okay, I've got to just pray some more and I've got to ask God to work in the hearts of his people. Now, that's, there's nothing new. The disciples did it with Jesus they were murmuring, complaining. They wanted to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. The children of Israel did it with Moses. Uh, there's nothing new. Uh, before Noah, it says in Genesis 6 that every man, woman, and child were so evil, their very intent was, was evil. And I'm sure that includes jealousies and envy and, and evil speaking of one another. And I find that interesting that I, I see that within the church still today. And born-again believers that uh, don't understand how to love and how to forgive. And that's something that's sad. It saddens me as a pastor as I watch it within God's church. Um, and I know that it saddens the Lord uh, when we treat one another that way. It's not to be. He goes on in verse four, but when the kindness and the love of God, our savior towards men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercies, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You see, when God's love appeared through his son, Jesus Christ, and it wasn't anything that we did, it was all by his work and by his grace that we became righteous through the washing and regeneration of the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that comes in us fully. We have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are God. All three are God, yet three persons, functioning as individuals, but yet all God completely. And when they appeared, and the love of God appeared, that's when we um, received his grace and his mercies, and we should also be giving his grace and mercies. It says, whom he poured out on us abundantly, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That is our hope. That is our joy. And that is the joy that keeps us from being evil and wicked and having malice and seeking after pleasures is the fact that we have eternal life and this world has nothing for us. And so he goes on. In verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Um, this was the instruction of the Apostle Paul to Titus. 
You know, these things are faithful sayings. And these things I want you to affirm constantly. Mm. Not once, constantly. Why is that? Because we don't hear it. <laughs> we, it goes in, my dad used to always say, Reuben, it's going in one ear and it comes right out the other because you didn't hear me. Yes, I did, Dad, I did. Well, then why didn't you do it? And I had all kinds of excuses why I didn't do it. No, he said constantly because we forget, because uh, we get busy, um, all kinds of reasons, and so we have to constantly hear it. Uh, unfortunately, some people that don't read their Bibles and understand that, they get upset. I remember uh, someone in the church uh, years ago, um, I would teach on a certain subject because, especially of the gifts, because it seemed to be an issue with some people. They were misusing them. And so again, I, I would say, hey, let me just reiterate, this is how they function, this is how they work. And, and after a few weeks and months of that, someone came up to me and says, we get it. You don't need to be repeating it. <laughs> you know. And, and I so badly wanted to respond in the same way, say, no, you don't. That's why I'm repeating it, because there's people that aren't getting it. And of course, they left because they were tired of hearing it. Instead of receiving it as a truth, uh, it bugged them too much. And probably because uh, they were part of that group that just wanted to misuse the gifts for whatever uh, pride they may have had. So constantly hearing the word, I love it. I've read through the Bible many, many, many times. I won't get tired of hearing it over and over again. Uh, my good friend Justin Alfred is always bringing up 1 Timothy 1.15. And I've got it memorized now because I hear it from him all the time. This is, this is a faithful saying. And, and truly, we can trust it that Christ came to die for sinners. Man, that is so awesome to think yes. about. And then Paul goes on to say, of whom I am the chief of sinners. Mm -hmm. And Justin says that all the time. And in the beginning, I, I thought, why is he repeating that? And then I realized I have to hear it over and over because every time I complain, every time I have a pity party, every time I think it's unfair, I realize I'm a chief of sinners. And I don't deserve a thing. And so I can then live with what happens to me because Christ lived with what happened to him. So I need to hear it constantly, constantly. And so this is a faithful saying he's saying, and you should constantly affirm it to those believers within your church uh, that maintain good works. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, you're not gonna hear me stop talking about being involved and having good works and serving the Lord because it's what the Bible teaches. And as long as the Bible is saying it as we go through the Bible, I'm going to share it because Paul said to, and of course, this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so we must be obedient to it. He says, these things are good and profitable to men. They're good for us, guys. <laughs> They're good things for us to maintain good works. Uh, it's profitable for all of us to be involved and to be busy. Now, some don't think so. Some think they could just come to church, sit down, and then go their merry way. Well, they're deceived, unfortunately. They have made up a set of their own rules, and their own rules trump God's rules. And so that is telling us that they have become their own gods, making up their rules, and they follow their rules, because God's rules are second to their rules. And in their rules, they're this. I'm too busy. I got this going on. I got that going on, and I don't have time. Uh, for God. I don't have time to serve. I don't have time to maintain spiritually good works. And so I'm taking care of my stuff before I take care of God's stuff. <clears throat> and that's not maintaining good works. And it's not profitable. Verse 9 says, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Um, <clears throat> there's a point where I'll listen to somebody, but when it's becoming an argument, I just stop. I said, I'm done. Sorry. Uh, we're not getting anywhere. We're just going around in circles. And so at this point, we just need to pray for one another and leave it in God's hands. Because I don't want to argue, first of all, and I'm tired of arguing with people because it doesn't help. And so I'd rather just stop and just walk away and and get busy with uh, the work that God has for me than being busy with, with an argument that's really not going anywhere at all. In fact, Paul says, uh, but avoid foolish disputes and genealogies. In verse 10, he says, reject the divisive man after the first and second admonition. When a man becomes divisive or, or, or heretic, where he's beginning to divide the body of Christ and bring in heresies, that's when you reject him. And that's clear. And that's something that the church does not do today. Unfortunately, and I'm sorry to say, 
that a lot of pastors don't do that. And now I get it that we need to have grace and mercy with people, but we also need to hold them accountable. Amen. God is a God of love and grace and mercy, but he's also a God of judgment and justice. And we need to understand that. We can love our enemies, but we don't allow our enemies uh, to come into our households and devour our families. We love you. We'll give you some food and water, and we'll see you uh, on your way, but you're not going to stay here and cause this division. We need to stand up for those truths. When a person is in a church and they're causing division, it's time to say goodbye. We love you. Here's some food. Uh, we'll pray for you. We pray God's grace upon you, but we're not going to allow you to stay among the sheep devouring them. It's not useful. And unfortunately, there are pastors that do that. You know, I, I and, and I'm kind of jumping the gun for Wednesday night because we're looking at Korah, and that's basically... Uh, what was happening, and Moses dealt with it right there on the spot. He didn't let it go on. He didn't say, oh, Korah, I'm glad you think that way. That's fine. We'll pray for you. Continue to fellowship with us, you know? No, because Korah would have built his army within Moses' um, uh, ministry as God gave it to him. No, Moses dealt with it. God in his face prayed to God and says, Lord, you decide here, and God took care of it. And I think we need to do that. There's churches that and I'll give you an example. A young man that came to this church became divisive, uh, became accusative of, of leadership, and then took people away from the church and then started his own ministry. And then we have pastors that are allowing him to fellowship within the churches because um, they want to be gracious. They want God to handle it. Well, God's already handled it. He's already told us what to do. Here in Titus, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. That's what that person is doing. Now, we don't condemn them, and nor do we reject them to harm them, but we reject them that hopefully they feel the shame that they repent. And that's the whole purpose, is that they repent and turn to the Lord, asking for forgiveness and repenting, truly repentance, which means you restore what you've stolen. And you're open with that. Now, read 2 Corinthians very clear, chapter 11, I believe it is, when it's talking about godly sorrows compared to worldly sorrows, where godly sorrows goes out of its way to show that I am truly sorry for what I have done. But this young man that I'm talking about, no idea. I've confronted him twice on the issue because he wants to become a Calvary Chapel and twice on the issue and I says no you haven't shown any fruit of repentance whatsoever and so as far as I'm concerned you know I've, I've rejected you as part of the fellowship at least with me at this point until you show that repentance and I'm willing more than willing to sit down but there is no sitting down because he's not able to and that's pride and that is truly pride so the Bible teaches that now it doesn't mean that we go and you know uh, blast their names on billboards and all of this stuff like that. You know, we trust in God, but we let them know that they've been rejected. So now he closes. Uh, when I send uh, uh, Artemis to you and Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at uh, Nicolopus, for I have decided to spend the winter there. And send Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollo on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let your people, or let our people, also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. Again, there's the good works, right? Uh, there's urgent needs um, that need to be maintained and good works within the ministry. So find good people to do that. Uh, also, or all who are with me greet you, greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Man. So what a neat little book. Titus is an awesome little book, and we should probably uh, read it over again. There's a lot of good stuff there. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, please post them, and we will pray for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to just open up your word and begin our new day, Father. May you just lead us and guide us today, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.